In July of 1992, 400 people from all over the world gathered for the first festival of archetypal psychology in honor of James Hillman, held at Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana. The festival brought together a diverse group of participants, artists, scholars, members of the men's movement and feminist movement, psychoanalysts, poets, and postmodern thinkers. This collection of 10 audio tapes highlights many of the most popular presentations at the festival. This first recording, Prolegomena, is the introductory address by James Hillman. And now, to introduce James Hillman, Tom Kapusinskis, the festival organizer. I'm going to now uh, step aside and uh, relinquish the stage to um, our guest of honor, um, the person really who has uh, probably affected all of us in one way or another, or no doubt we wouldn't be here. And uh, it's, a, it's a great chance to celebrate him and, and his work. Uh, I don't actually know, know what to say about uh, Jim Hillman, uh, because he's probably known to all of you in one way or another, either through his work or through his person. So I'm just going to tell one of my Jim Hillman stories and get out of the way. It's not nearly as good as uh, Higuchi-san's Jim Hillman story when Hillman drove uh, a softball deep to the outfield and Higuchi circled under it, made the catch, and ruined Hillman's day. But my story goes back about, um, oh, I don't know, 1965 or 6, however many years ago that is, uh, the first time that I uh, encountered Jim Hillman. I was a law student here at Notre Dame and uh, enduring law school, as you might say. And uh, a colleague, friend of mine on campus said, would you like to go to a seminar on alchemy uh, at the university? <laughs> at the University of Chicago. Uh, this fellow is a Jungian from Zurich. And I thought, well, I hate law school. What the hell? Why not? <laughs> so, uh, so we drove in together. And uh, that was uh, the beginning of something really quite marvelous for me. That is, uh, a few nights running uh, at the U of C, Jim Hillman held forth on his ideas about alchemy. And afterwards, I had the chance to meet him at uh, a colleague's apartment. And we talked a little bit about Zurich. And uh, three years later, I decided uh, to go to Switzerland to, uh, to go through the training experience myself. And uh, so um, that's one of my <laughs> Jim Hillman stories. But it was a great beginning of what has been a great friendship. And I'm very pleased and very honored to ask James Hillman to come up to the microphone. emotion that grips me this evening has a sweet name, gratis, gratitudo, charis, gratitude. Gratitude to Tom and to Jude and to Paul Kugler and to Karen and to Charles Bohr and to Margot McLean for all their preliminary work. And of course, Harriet Baldwin is already home taking care of her leg. But and to Lawrence and Suzanne and Julia Hillman, whose own connections to the spirit are strong enough so that their father doesn't seem to stand in the way, to old friends of close to 40 years, like Bob Stein and Kenny Donahue, to travelers from Brazil, England, 
France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Canada, Switzerland, and Venezuela, and Texas, too, <laughs> and, and translators, and students, and writers, and artists, and dancers, and especially gratitude to readers. Now, the trouble with this gratitude is that gratitude, you know, as you go on with it, becomes platitude very quickly, <laughs> and, and even becomes a whole attitude. But anyway, <laughs> gratitude, I suppose, vocatus or non vocatus, those of you who are Jungians know what I'm referring to, whether invoked or not, she will be present like the immortals or the chorus, like that floating image in a Woody Allen film, my mother, hovering over this gathering willy-nilly, horribile dictu. Gratitude for a community, the emotion of Gemeinschaftsgefühl being present in a communal soul. For we each work very alone and feel alone in our distant places. Our jobs and our homes are not among brothers and sisters. Besides, psychology has an insidiously isolating effect, which is part of its whiteness, keeping us in the white ghetto of the observing mind. This analytical isolation is one reason for the shift years ago from an analytical psychology to an archetypal psychology, which calls up the networks of the communal soul, that we are joined by the rivers and roots of imagination, the patterns of images that underlie human culture, natural occasions, social institutions, and ethnic geographies. This festival arises from and will display that river, those roots. It will affirm that though we are each separate and idiosyncratic, we are each drawn beyond ourselves because of that river and those roots. Now, the, this community tonight is not new. This festival is not the first, and maybe not a last, although the sense that it may be the last states how precious and how dear and rare we feel it to be. Actually, we've been carrying on like this for years and often under the skilled hand of our impresario. Perhaps my first meeting with Robert Bly was with and through Tom here at a similar festival in the 70s. We did this in Buffalo at least twice and with such gentle hosts there. In Dallas frequently and splendidly and at Malarag in France with friends from the Pan Theater whom we'll be watching uh, later on and at Eranos on Lago Maggiore. The tradition of fun, freak, and festivity belongs to this psychology since its furious beginnings, about which Pat Berry will tell us much, I suspect, uh, in Zurich 20 or 25 years ago. Notre Dame has been very good to us, and let's be glad for it and glad for the Catholic with the small c, meaning universal, or as it's now called, multicultural. In fact, the Catholics have always been close to archetypal psychology, a reason which I shall be coming to shortly. We have been warmly hosted at Salve Regina in Rhode Island, at Lone Mountain in San Francisco, and of course at that bastion of black-frocked men, the University of Dallas. <laughs> so we are here as a community of soul participating in a common imagination, to live and work from imagination to pledge allegiance to images, to surrender agency to their freedom, to their creative invention, to follow their example as exemplars. This all counters the excessive individualism of the culture and its ego psychology and self-promotion economics. You know, all the noble power words of our culture, the psychological shibboleths we live by, are individualistic and not communal. Freedom, dignity, achievement, expression, depth of soul, integrity, health, love, salvation, their meanings are constricted by being bound to us as eaches, apart, separated. My rights, my dignity, my freedom, my salvation. Love as my personal relationship. Creativity means self-expression. Education, self-improvement, help, self-help, 
therapy, self-realization. In economics, Adam Smith's pernicious notion of self-interest. What stands in the way of community is the word self. And what restores us to community is commonality of imagination in its archetypal depths. I learned only in the last few years about the community of soul that occurs when participating in a common imagination. First in the, the myth and movement uh, workshops that Deborah McCall and I did in various places in the States and Canada and Italy. And second in the men's conferences and retreats with Robert Bly, Michael Mead, Ricardo Morrison, Aido Holmes, and others of you here this evening. And I'm glad you guys are here. In these groups, regions of the soul become alive that are not even entered in classical therapy. I've also learned much from Susie Gablick and from Mary Watkins of ways out of individualism that would reconstitute artworks and therapy as communal practices. Our distinctness, our individuality, appears in the middle of the madding crowd as we display our natures, as we are lost in participations like dancing, and not as we are detached in modernist observation. I am promoting with this phrase commonality of imagination, a Dionysian notion of self, in our dismemberment, in the fluidity of our boundaries, the loosening into this place this week, we will be suffering that psychopathologic phenomenon called an abasement du niveau mental, a lowering of the mental level. <laughs> it's called brains unleashed in some places. It's called just doing it in another one of the groups. It's also called below the belt in another one of the groups. But anyway, by remembering Dionysus, can Eros be far behind? Common feeling is one of the cloaks of Eros. We feel his presence in different ways. Affection for one another, nostalgias, hot attractions, inspirations, sympathy, a faithfulness toward aspirations, and a passionate devotion to those aspirations. Admiration, respect, longing for sweet delight, yearning for fulfillment. Eros appears in all kinds of ways. I do believe Eros to be the great cause or the prima mobile for our being here this evening. And I believe Eros manifests partly in the generous dedication of these days and nights to the spirit of James Hillman, who himself, as a self, in his person, can offer neither sympathy, sweetness, nor fulfillment, neither faithfulness, nor passionate interest, nor respect, affection, or delight in the quality and quantity that is required. He himself is but a mountebank, an effigy useful to constellate that emotion which draws the soul from its private concerns into the public arena and give embodiment so that Eros can appear at all. If Hillman were not, he would have to be invented. <laughs> The emotions that move soul must have their objective correlatives in defined images, and the soul invents figures, biographies, ideologies that are larger than life in order for the gods to be served. The special place Hillman has been given here has little to do with personality and much to do with personifying. And as we know from Paul Kugler and literary theory, Whatever is said about a text, a person, an object, says a lot more about who is talking than about the text, the person, or the object. So watch out during the roast. You really be... <laughs> you will really be talking about yourself. <laughs> or let us say it has to do with theater. The erotic also theatricalizes. We become characters for one another, playing out the plots that the daimon Eros enjoys. It is in this sense that Eros awakens the soul to its imagining capacity, places our lives into an imaginal scenario, a cosmos of imaginations. And we become for one another for a short time while the drama or the festival lasts, mythic personages 
companions on the Argonaut, walking to Canterbury, telling tales. Later this evening, we will be at the theater literally, but the theater does not stop when Enrique Pardo's gestures and sounds conclude. All the world's a stage for Eros. <clears throat> Archetypal psychology has been continually forced to Eros by its tradition, Romantic, Renaissance, Hellenic, from Plotinus to Corbin. This tradition repeatedly said that erotic experience and the knowledge of eidos, or idea, the archetypal vision, are indissolubly united. The main road to the sense that life is governed by archetypal powers is the road of the passions. The gods are most real when we are possessed. So limited is our usual perception. Hence the necessity for erotic pathologies to which we will come in a moment. That's a rhetorical trick to keep your interest. <laughs> How else can Eros get through in a non-erotic culture? According to the Platonists, and I'm following uh, uh, Friedlander, there is a third term in the linkage besides Eros and Eidos and that's polis, community, city. And these are the main terms of this week, eros, ideas, and the city. Or pleasure, the archetypal imagination, and community. The Platonists are also telling us, and Wolfgang Giegrich will have a lot to say about the faults of Platonism tomorrow morning, that the guiding spirit, the daimonion, is not individually personal but it too belongs to community. Perhaps the community speaks through the interior voice of the daimon. Perhaps that voice that is telling you no, yes, is actually the voice of the community. And that ethics is actually an erotic phenomenon. In this evocation of Eros, we have to remember it cannot be equated with harmless love often preached by Christianism. Eros is a daimonion. It has demon demonic dimensions by which Plato meant it is beyond reason. Therefore, our experience of Eros is, so, is often one of yearning for what is not here, because it always invites the beyond, yearning for what is not here. So our disappointments here, our unfulfilled hopes, show that Eros is indeed present, for this yearning for something further, something more, is the pothos of Eros that boundless intensity of desire that can never be fulfilled except by what is not here, not now, not the never-never land. Remember, the mother of Eros, Penia, is ever empty. The fact that Eros is with us reveals itself in the very feeling of incompletion, like an addictive hunger for still more and more. Now we've arrived at the main theme of this prolegomenon. Now this is where we go off a little further. Which, by the way, I have not been calling to myself a prolegomenon, but an adumbration. Partly because I prefer a word with dumb in the middle of it than one with ego in the middle of it. But an adumbration is a sketchy foreshadowing putting shadow out in front, leading off with the shadow of Eros, the shadow in the culture, a theme not handled in archetypal psychology enough, even if touched by Lynn Cowan, Tom Moore, Adolf Guggenbuhl, Bob Stein, Lopez Pedraza, or each of you in private chambers. And I am mean to be talking now about pornography. Right away, a definition. The stimulation of lust through imaging, and the stimulation of imaging through lust. I think we should drop the arousal or stimulation part of the definition, since stimulation or arousal is always contextual, depending on many variables, so that lustful images uh, for many people are not stimulating at all. So in brief, pornography is lustful images and imagistic lust. I offer this definition to replace that of the dictionaries which link pornography with obscene, meaning dirty, filthy, offensive to modesty and decency. Although the Greeks used the word porne, prostitute, 
and graph drawn, written in English, pornography enters the dictionary, interestingly enough, only in mid-Victorian times, the 1850s, when it received its obscene qualification. Let's straight away clean up this mess that muddles obscenity with pornography. Although the Justice Department has a national obscenity unit for which you are paying, <laughs> what obscenity is remains unclarified. Mainly it is defined as depictions or descriptions of sexual activities or organs offensive to local community standards and without redeeming scientific or artistic merit. The obscene is wholly sexualized. You see what's happened. What is obscene by being identified with a sexual means the sexual is where the obscenity is to be found. Toxic dumps, clear-cut forest land, strangulated seals, disfigured aliens and exploding automobiles on TV, Schwarzkopf's briefings, Richard Serra's rusty girders plunked down in public squares, President Bush in South Central LA, none of this is legally obscene. Yet none of this has scientific or artistic merit. <laughs> Obscenity has been wholly dislocated from its actual daily occasions and displaced onto sexual activities and organs. But I know buildings more obscene than Marilyn Chambers. And buildings can't be turned off. You can't switch the channel. You're forced to enter them. Clearly, our culture is more afraid of viewing an ordinary human anus than of the assholes we watch on TV. More afraid, more afraid of Maplethorpe's ejaculating penis than of Rambo's automatic rifle. That pornography is the main theme of these opening adumbrations to this festival may seem out of taste, I think it is appropriate for six main reasons. Let me lay them out. <laughs> so bear with me. First, it recognizes a major preoccupation of the state of Indiana, our hosting locus. Here, Mr. Tyson was tried, found guilty by Hoosiers, and is incarcerated. Here in South Bend itself, at the Kitty Cat Club on South Michigan, the case arose that went finally to the Supreme Court where, in what has become sort of the National Pasty Act, the court declared totally nude dancing nationally illegal. This is the state of Ken and Barbie Quayle. Here are Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Here are Mr. and Mrs. Vice President went through their puberty, their courtship, and their moral education. And here in Bloomington, appropriately near the south end of this state, as Notre Dame is at the north end, you will find the Kinsey Institute and Research Center. <laughs> A discussion of pornography does indeed belong in Indiana. Second, pornography is an appropriate theme at a Roman Catholic institution. Christianity, since its inception, has been troubled, rightly so, with sexuality. We might too easily ridicule the church's focus on sexuality as a fetishistic obsession, were it not a representation of something truly menacing to its order and its principles. And I mean the return of the pagan gods whose via regia into monotheistic culture is the irrepressible sexuality of the imagination. Beneath the fig leaf of the icons, the parochial airbrush of anti-condom counseling advice. Beneath the wide and worldly robes of the church, like the plain gray raincoat of everyday adaptation, there lurks the ever-latent, ever-potent pagan flasher. <laughs> Paganism, as the church recognizes, is concrete, sensate, its divinities imminent in a cosmos that enjoys its lust. If this seems provocative, it is so. My thrust is such. <laughs> it has always been a function of archetypal psychology, and David Miller has helped me see this, to serve within a larger, more rational mode of thought, 
whether that be academic scholarship, professional therapy, Christian theology, or even today's simplistic doctrines of maleness. To serve, that is, as a, the Jew of the diaspora, never wholly assimilated, always the insidious and strident reminder of shadow, challenging the larger order by pushing into its lacuna. In specific regard to the appropriateness of pornography at this Catholic institution, let's recall that the great theological foundations of the church, its patristic philosophy, took rise largely in arguments against pagans and sometimes Jews. And by the way, Charles Bohr, who's now sole and full editor of the journal Spring, is devoting the next issue entirely to the theme of pagans, Christians, and Jews. Therefore, in speaking of paganism, as Jeanette Perry uses the term, we are continuing the ancient polemics. The struggle over pornography is the struggle with paganism. And so by raising the issue here, we are continuing into the next millennium arguments that began two millennia ago. We are actually serving the fertility of Christian theology, for these issues were not settled by the conversion of Constantine. And were there no challenging champions of paganism, the church could easily rigidify into its fatuous, self-satisfied pronouncements, rightly called bulls. <laughs> Only a viciousness that stands for what it considers vice can vitiate its own vicious circle. Break it open to confront the unconverted paganism that still flickers in the soul and flickers literally from the home altars of video porn flicks all through the United States. This subject is third appropriate for social and humane reasons. Sexual violations are a sign of the times. In the United States, about 2,000 rapes occurred today and will each day. One out of eight adult American women will be victim of rape. The definition of rape I'll leave aside. Child molestation, child prostitution, satanic sexual cults, venereal disease, why enumerate all of this is very well known to you. From its beginning in Paris and Vienna, the principal task of depth psychology has been to enlighten the sexual life of the citizen. By enlighten, I mean lighten up, so that sexuality is less oppressive and therefore less repressed. Humor helps. Didn't Freud use jokes and embarrassing slips of the tongue as part of his mode of enlightenment? The oppressive feelings accompanying lust belong partly to the, to the tumescence of lust and partly to the psychodynamics of repression. Lift repression and you enlighten. Enlighten, lighten up, and you lift repression. Jung's model of instinctual action and archetypal image says that whatever we do with images affects instinct. The more formed the images, the less blind the action. And you all know the theory I'm referring to in volume eight, the ultraviolet or blue end and the infrared instinctual end of the same spectrum image and instinct inseparable. This means that images are instinctual and instincts imaginational. Since they are aspects of each other, Jung's model logically implies that any change in either affects the other. It follows then that the repression of sexual instincts reduces imagination and makes instinct more oppressive allowing it to return as the repressed will anyway, as obsessive sexual fantasies displaced into the hundred channels of our daily TV life. However, we could also see the obsessive sexual fantasy of our times as the instinct trying to enlighten itself, trying to get out of the box, mercurious trapped in the TV set. Here in Indiana some years ago with Ken Donahue and Bob Stein at the Kinsey Archive, we saw volumes of prison erotica on deposit, 
love letters, drawings, artifacts that inmates had made, confiscated as pornography by the prison authorities. The blue end, weren't pornographic films once called blue movies? The blue end of imagination was forcibly repressed, and the instinctual end acted out in prison rape, buggery, and prostitution. Fourth, it is appropriate for me to erect this theme. <laughs> Has not the aura, the aroma of the scandalous always floated around yours truly? Is it not given astrologers in that tenth house Uranus in Pisces? square ascendant? And does not pornography belong among those transgressional subjects like betrayal, masturbation, suicide, abandoning the child, pathologizing in general, and such terms as soul, beauty, and underworld? And is it not appropriate for a man of 66, an aging senior citizen with Medicare, each year pushed further by the Senex into lecherous, perverse senility, and to proving he can still rise to an occasion. <laughs> For according to the law, as physical powers wane, this is the basic idea of the old uh, law about Saturn, as physical powers wane, the vis imaginativa, the activity of the imagination, increases. And the pig, the dog, and the goat, medieval images of melancholy, old age, acedia, dryness of the spirit, are also images of the shameless, bestial imagination. What could be more authentic to archetypal psychology's internal logic than an epistrophe of pornography? Pornography seems distressed by their separation and continually attempts to bring them together. The old ways of keeping it apart no longer work. Closed sections of the library, red light sections of towns, privacy of sexual tastes, no longer can these be walled off. The private is utterly public, like the Tyson trial, the Trump affair, the Kennedy Smith case, or the revivalist clergy with Miss Jessica Hahn. Is the pubic hair on a Coke can described at a hearing of the Senate Judiciary Committee private or public? Already, the new definition of self proposed in uh, the book that Ventura and I did, A Hundred Years of Psychotherapy in the World is Getting Worse, uh, this new definition of self as the interiorization of community is displayed as the sexual fantasy of the private person becoming a communal fantasy belonging to res publica. At least one shelf in the video store is now devoted to homemade porn, homemade private movies for public sale, like pages of friends and neighbors and close family laid out nude in the pages of Hustler. Now, to state the evident doesn't mean approval or disapproval. It's not the question. It merely presents that vast dimension of the public sector as no longer a private matter. Kiddies home from school in the afternoon can watch talk shows on sex change, kinky prostitution, threesome swinging. The soaps show ever more nudity and heavy breathing. And owing to AIDS, your own pubics have become publics. Public officials in their mission to save our national health must assume positions on the wearing of condoms. The question to ask, as with any new symptom, if symptom this is, what need in the public body does this rampant pornography meet? By rampant, I'm referring to the soft form that lures our longing, our pothos, keeping us unfulfilled, consumptive consumers. The ordinary answers about this pornographic need in the public body come quick to the tongue. The obverse of Puritan repression, the loss of nature, woman and body, the patriarchal phallic gaze, an apocalyptic sign of the end of civilization, and so on and so forth. But I think there's a tremendous erotic hunger in the collective psyche for enlivening images. Imagination wants to be stirred, basically, for which it turns first to the simplest and the most base. And now sixth. 
and then that's it. It's appropriate sixth, finally, for political reasons, perhaps for the very existence of gatherings such as this. And now I'm taking some thoughts from David Friedberg's superb, thick book, The Power of the Image, University of Chicago, 1989. Inasmuch as an archetypal psychology, the topic of this festival, starts with and sticks to images, what the soul really consists in and does, images. And inasmuch as archetypal psychology assumes the cosmos, because it's ensouled, to be an aesthetic display of imaginings, the image above all else must be defended. Now, says Friedberg, images do work in such a way as to incite desire. And since, he said, the eyes are the channel to the other senses, pictures make us look. They seduce us into looking. The gaze stimulates the other senses and arouses. Arousal fetishizes the object. We're fixed by it and to it. What holds the gaze is this demonic power in the image. It's superhuman or divine force. Images, and not only sexually explicit images, make eros visible and are demonic. And so for centuries, artworks have been said to lead to vice and their beauty corrupting. Plato insisted in the Republic, the images of the arts must be controlled. This Aristotle restated in his politics, quote, it should therefore be the duty of government to prohibit all statuary and painting which portrays any sort of indecent action. So you see that censorship is an inherent response to that power in the image and not to any particular content. Because, Friedberg, the potential for, for arousal immediately and irresistibly accrues from the interaction between people and images. Pornographic images are only one case of wider arousal. Holy images have been spontaneously savaged, as, for instance, Michelangelo's Pieta. As, for example, bourgeois images, for example, Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's Night Watch was savaged, stabbed three times in this century as well as thousands smashed and defaced by governmental edicts from ancient Egypt to small churches in rural England. In this wider sense, all images are pornographic in their arousal capacity, an arousal which recognizes the animation or the active soul in the image. A bill before Congress called the Pornography Victims Compensation Bill perversely recognizes this power in the image. It would hold producers of pornography legally responsible for illegal actions committed by users of porn. Did you get that? It would hold producers, the manufacturers, the publishers, the writers of pornography legally responsible for illegal criminal actions committed by the users of porn. This bill not only removes responsibility from the citizen for his actions, it also would write into law what has never been established a link between pornography and criminal sexual behavior. Both President Johnson's commission, uh, which published a report in 1970, and the Mies report in eight, 1986, failed to find reliable evidence that significantly connects pornography with criminal sexual behavior. Now, the time isn't right and the feeling appropriate to explore our theme further. I've thought only to justify the theme as such. What kind of pornography should be allowed, what kind censored, and if censored, how and by whom, are not our concern. I've rather exposed a claim for all porn in principle before whittling away at the edges. We must stay with the essential issue. The war against pornography is only obliquely motivated by the pious defense of naked children the protection of exploited women, the prevention of sexual crimes, or the safeguarding of wholesome values. The war is the ancient one of iconoclasm against images, of spirit against soul, of purity against pleasure, of the higher mind against the thonic powers. That pornographic images are sometimes cruel, degrading, dismembered, and unidimensionally literal 
what else isn't in our culture, portrays de vero areas of human imagining and thus instinct. These images are psychic facts too, images of soul. As the Supreme Court said in 1971, one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. To increase the lyric factor, I suggest as the task before us as citizens. Friedberg relates the formal quality of an image, its beauty, to its sacred arousal power. Better formed images have more effect. For instance, the Pieta and the Night Watch. The answer to the pornography as a problem is thus, don't suppress the vulgar, just form it better, make it more beautiful. So I'm suggesting that the best control of pornography would be one that employs beauty, art, and ritual to give it soul, to enlighten it, no longer subliminal, subtextual, no longer sublimation disguised into artful symbolism, but the sublime, which includes the gross and crass within a finer form. The purifying position against pornography, which begins with the move of confusing the obscene with the erotic, and the sexually graphic. You see, that's the problem, confusing the obscene with the erotic and the sexually graphic, is the first iconoclasm, symbolic of all other repressions of the image. The issue, Friedberg says, is as much social control, social control as sexual control. The issue, I would add, is akin to the control of the responses of the human body, or as Thomas Soss says, control of the citizen's body by the state otherwise known as slavery. The issue of pornography is as vital to our political present and future as other areas of bodily liberty, abortion rights, the rights of assembly, to ingest substances, to commit suicide, to be protected by law against physical assault and unjust punishment. At last, I've come to the end, I've tried to persuade you that I'm doing the right thing in making this theme my contribution. I've wanted to encourage you all to trespass beyond the correct for years, and I'm connecting back to the long history of the Western Church, to the church teachers who founded this university 150 years ago at this South Bend, this bent south piece of the St. Joseph River, to the serious state of Indiana, and of the short history of archetypal psychology, which again and again acknowledges in its precincts the pagan powers of Pan and Dionysus and Aphrodite and Eros and Persephone and Hades, but also the saints and fathers whose knowledge of this theme cannot be surpassed. And now in order to conclude, in order to favor the return of the main repressed polytheistic or pagan psychology, to end the closeted sectioning of private and public that supports the tight borders of self-centeredness, and in defense of the image, as president of Spring Publications, and in honor of this festival, I'm announcing an award, the Spring Award for Enlightened Imagining, of $500 to be shared between the Kinsey Institute of Bloomington, Indiana, in recognition of its service in opening the private sphere to public knowledge, and to Professor Al Lingus of Penn State University for his explorations in marginal sensate experience, culminating in his article, Lost in Spring, 1950, in spring 51. Whether, one more sentence, whether the Spring Award for Enlightened Imagining will be given annually, occasionally, or ever again, only time will tell Thank you, have fun, or as the Jewish mother would say, enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> this concludes Prolegomena with James Hillman. If you would like a complete listing of cassette presentations available from the first festival of archetypal psychology or a free catalog of transformational audio tapes, please call Sounds True, 1-800-333-9185. Thanks for listening.